everyone, uh, and welcome to the second season of the MAP webinar series. Um, we have three speakers today. Uh, we're going to hear from Edmund Chang from Stony Brook University, Michaela Vasudi from Columbia University, and Ron Lindsay from the University of Washington. Um, we, uh, we, we started this uh, webinar series last year. We had 35 speakers and I believe nine webinar sessions. Um, and over 400 attendees of the series, so it's very successful. And um, so we're starting up again this year. We have uh, 10 topics this year, 10 webinar topics. And um, you've received a link in uh, the email message that I sent. It's also up on the screen right now um, for this uh, webinar season. And um, so check that out. We'll be posting the speakers uh, probably within the next week or so. We're just waiting to confirm a few final individuals before putting the entire schedule up. Um, but check out that website for um, listings of the uh, webinars and who will be speaking and the topics also. Um, so, Edmund, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is pass control over to your computer right now. Sure. Okay, you see my desktop now? Yep, we can see it. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and get started. Sure. Hello, everyone. This is Edmund Chan from Stony Brook University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Northern Hemisphere cyclone trends uh, as found in the reanalysis data to some work uh, that I did with uh, the help of a graduate student, Albert Yao. Uh, this research is funded by a lower project uh, assessing the quality of synoptic scale variability uh, derived from the 20th century reanalysis project. So the motivation uh, is that several studies have suggested that northern hemisphere storm threat activity has increased between 1950 and 1919, but most of the studies are based on NCEP NCAR reanalysis data. Uh, more recently, suggested that NCEP NCAR and EIA-40 may have various trends due to changing observing system, especially the observing system in the upper air with large increase in satellite and uh, aircraft observations during the late 60s or uh, into the 70s. Uh, NOAA's 20th century analysis, they uh, only use service observations, and so it's expected to contain less of a serious trend. Uh, in February, I've already shown some uh, re early results based on our assimilation of upper tropospheric fields. Uh, basically, uh, we defined storm track at that time uh, based on uh, the variance of 300 HPA meridional velocity is basically uh, at the kinetic energy of those storms. Uh, and we compared the three reanalysis that actually stands from nine, uh, late 1950s to 2000 and compared to variance output uh, computed directly from rain storm observations. And our results, uh, just a brief summary, uh, is over regions with rain storm observations. The trends derived from the 20th century reanalysis is most consistent with those derived from observation, even though rainstorm observations are not assimilated into the 20th century analysis, but are assimilated into ERA-40 and NCEP NCAR reanalysis. In particular, the trend in the Pacific derived from 20th century analysis is much lower than those derived from NCEP NCAR reanalysis or ERA-40. So this is just one example. Uh, here I highlighted the regions over which the uh, variants are computed. Uh, the dots are the radio sound stations, and uh, the variants computed by the radio sound are shown by the black lines, and for the other the free reanalysis is shown by the uh, uh, lines with other color. And we see that the year-to-year -year variability uh, follow each other very closely. Uh, if we compute the trend. Uh, in terms of percentage, what we found that over this region, despite uh, the, the EI-40 and NSAP NCAR analysis assimilating radio sound observation, uh, the trend that uh, derived uh, from observation actually agrees best with, the 20th, with, with that derived from the 20th century reanalysis. Now, so uh, we conducted further analysis uh, as to how these biases uh, may impact statistics. Uh, 
keep in mind that there are a lot more observations uh, during these early periods uh, in the 50s and 60s uh, near the surface than upper air. So uh, the data we use are six hourly sea level pressure data uh, from 20th century analysis, CI40 and NSAP ANCA reanalysis. Uh, we focus on uh, the northern hemisphere winter season here. Uh, before we go into the cyclone, uh, we first examine the sea level pressure variance statistics. Uh, in a previous study, uh, I've compared the trends in sea level pressure variance derived from NSAP ANCAR reanalysis to those, and the yeah, 40 to those derived from ship observations, and found that the uh, Pacific storm trap trend uh, based on the ship observations uh, probably uh, in the range of 20 to 60 percent of that found in NSAP ANCAR reanalysis. This uncertainty is because uh, the ship observations actually uh, are found to have um, time varying observational errors, and so uh, the trend computed from ship observations uh, is a bit uncertain. Uh, the trend in the Atlantic, uh, however, are more consistent, uh, probably because there are more ship observations. So the question is uh, how uh, do the trends of the 20th century analysis compare? So here I show the results uh, based uh, for the Pacific uh, sea level pressure variance statistics. Uh, the red line, uh, EI40, the blue line from 20th century analysis, and the black uh, line from NSAP ANCAR analysis. Uh, if you just look at the year-to-year -year variability, they agree very, very well. Uh, however, there are some slight differences, especially during the early part. You can see that uh, 20th century analysis uh, generally have slightly higher variance compared to the other, uh, whereas over the second period, uh, the uh, 20th century analysis have slightly lower variance, this for the Pacific. And giving rise to a slightly lower trend. Uh, so uh, if we compute the trend over the 41 years uh, for ERA-40 and NSAP NCAR reanalysis, uh, they suggest, both suggest that the variance increased by over 10%, uh, and that's significant at a 95% uh, level, accounting for the year-to-year uh, -year variability. Uh, whereas uh, for the 20th century reanalysis, the trend is only about 60% of that in NSAP ANCAR reanalysis, and it's not significant at 95% level. So that 60% figure actually is more consistent with that estimated based on ship observations. Uh, for the Atlantic, again, the year-to-year -year variability agrees very well. Uh, the trends agree better uh, with all three trends uh, being in the uh, uh, over 10% and uh, are all significant at the 95% level. Uh, if we look at the spatial pattern, what we find, see that in the, uh, this, the difference between the 90s and the 60s, uh, two 10 years period, and what we find is that uh, in the Pacific, uh, the all three reanalysis show a large areas of significant increase. Uh, whereas over the Pacific, uh, there are areas of increase and decrease, with the 20th century reanalysis showing slightly smaller area of increase and slightly larger area of decrease, uh, giving rise to uh, a, an integrated trend that is lower uh, compared to the other two reanalysis. So just uh, a summary for the sea level pressure variance, uh, the Pacific trend in sea level pressure variance in the 20th century reanalysis comes out to be approximately 60% of that in the NSAP ANCAR reanalysis, and this is more consistent with trend estimated based on ship observations. And the Atlantic trend uh, are consistent, more or less consistent between the three reanalysis data sets. So uh, let's go to cyclone track statistics. Uh, so, uh, the method we use, uh, we use the feature tracking algorithm developed by Hodges and we track two different definitions of cyclones. Uh, the first definition is uh, def cyclone defined as the minima in total sea level pressure, so we just track the raw sea level pressure data and all cyclones uh, with uh, minimum pressure less than 10, uh, 1,020 head per scale are tracked. Uh, we also track uh, cyclones as perturbation. 
uh, the sea level pressure data in this second method. Uh, the sea level pressure data is filtered uh, by first removing the seasonal mean uh, and then uh, keep only the uh, smaller spatial scale, uh, the really low frequency large scale perturbations uh, with a scale of uh, less than T5 uh, are all removed. And uh, we keep only cyclones lasting longer than two days and traveling over 1,000 kilometers. Uh, before we, I show the trend, uh, I'll show you some uh, of the comparisons between the raw cyclone statistics between the different reanalysis data set. So this is taken from the period 1979 to 2001 uh, with the satellite era. And uh, we, here we also added the ELA interim as a comparison. Uh, the first comparison I show is the cyclone count as a function of minimum pressure uh, along the track. And what we see is that uh, the agreement between the different analysis, reanalysis seems to be quite good, except that uh, ELA interim seems to have more cyclones uh, in the midi middle ranges whereas the other three reanalysis actually agree quite well. And particularly in the uh, high end or the strong end of the spectrum, uh, 20th century reanalysis actually do a uh, similar, um, uh, similar level as the other reanalysis, despite it only a surface pressure observations. In terms of duration, uh, again, uh, even in the long, uh, long duration, range, uh, the 20th century reanalysis uh, again uh, do a similar job as the other. So it suggests, the, this uh, analysis suggests that the cyclone characteristics in the uh, different reanalysis are very similar to each other. So we look at trends. Uh, here we first look at uh, the, the first definition, uh, the raw, the, the, the uh, cyclones defined as sort of uh, by the full pressure field. Uh, we look at the count of deep cyclones. Uh, by deep cyclones, we find at cyclones deeper than 975 hectopascal, and the number of tracks per year, uh, per season, uh, in which uh, we have this uh, number of cyclones. What we see is that, again, the interannual variability agree quite well, and all three reanalysis show uh, some trends uh, with the trend shown by the NSAT reanalysis being the biggest. And that's actually the only trend that's significant at the 95% level, uh, basically because of the really large year-to-year -year variability when we look at this statistic. So it goes from less than 15 uh, per year to over 40, uh, over 35 per year. Uh, for the, again, the, the trend uh, based on 20th century reanalysis is uh, slower is lower than that based on NSAP NCARI analysis, uh, consistent with the variance statistics. Over the, Pacific, uh, over the Atlantic, uh, all three again show trends and all are not significant at 95% level, although uh, the AI41 is definitely uh, significant at 90% level. But the agreement is uh, slightly better here. So. Uh, if we compare all these different trends, uh, the variance uh, at up level, at the surface, as well as cyclone count, there seems to be some uh, inconsistency. But uh, if we first look at the uh, Atlantic, by and large, everything uh, shows a double-digit increase uh, over the period. Uh, the thing that stands out is that the NSAP reanalysis shows a much larger increase uh, in, uh, in upper level uh, antikinetic energy compared to the other two analysis. Over the Pacific, the differences are much larger uh, with the 20th century reanalysis showing a much smaller increase, uh, whereas the, again, the Pacific showing really, uh, the anti <coughs> analysis is much increase in the Pacific. Uh, but if, if we increase if we compare just the surface quantities, uh, NSAP and analysis seems to show, uh, well, all three analysis show much bigger uh, change in cyclone counts than in, than, in the, um, that, than in pressure variance. If we compare the pattern, uh, we look at the sea level pressure pattern uh, previously, but uh, if we look at the 
uh, of level at the kinetic energy. What we see is that in the Atlantic, they are by and large consistent, but in the Pacific, there's big differences. So we look at the mean flow, and what we find is that in the upper level, uh, the mean flow change as shown by the uh, 300 millibar height, the seasonal mean height. Um, there's significant mean flow change over the Atlantic, but very little change over the Pacific, suggesting that it's, the mean flow change is, doesn't seem to be consistent with large uh, storm draft change. Another thing to note is that there seems to be uh, a decrease in pressure near the oceans as well as near the Iceland uh, over this period. So uh, there seems to be significant mean flow change over the Atlantic and very little mean flow change over the Pacific. And the large change in the number of deep cyclones, perhaps in part due to trend in sea level pressure. And to uh, illustrate that, we define cyclones by removing the seasonal mean and large spatial scale uh, and count uh, any perturbation that's le less than 25 HPA, uh, negative 25 HPA in the Pacific. And what we see is that in this definition of cyclone activity, uh, the trend in the 20th century reanalysis is uh, removed. So uh, in terms of summary, uh, the characteristics of sea level pressure cyclones are similar. Uh, there are a large increase in, uh, in deep cyclones, uh, but part of these trends are likely due to trends in the mean flow. And this is my last slide. Uh, the conclusions from this analysis is that uh, the Atlantic trends largely consistent, except that NSF anchor analysis uh, seems to have much larger trend in the upper level than the others, and it's perhaps spurious. Uh, and the main conclusion is that our results confirm that trends in tropical storm track activity found in the 20th century reanalysis do exhibit less bias than those derived from the other two reanalysis. And uh, the characteristics of cyclones in the <coughs> century reanalysis seem to have overall quality similar to those in the other reanalysis. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Edmund. Uh, if there are any questions on the line or in the room for Edmund, please hold them until the end. We're going to have a discussion session at the end of the webinar, um, and you can ask individual questions or just general questions for each of the three speakers. Mikhail, are you on the line? Yep. Okay, great. I'm going to pass control over to your computer. Okay. So is it, does it look all right? Uh, no, you're going to have to go to Quick Start and then click Share My Desktop. Okay. Here we go. Is it? Great. Okay. That looks. That looks good. We're on. Yep, we're on. Okay, so, so whenever you're ready. <clears throat> so, um, thanks everybody. Um, so today I'm going to talk um, again about the 20th century reanalysis. And uh, the focus here is going to be on um, mostly the variability of rainfall. And uh, um, so the, most of you probably are familiar, but the 20th century analysis is uh, the brainchild of Gil Compo, and um, it's a little bit different from the, um, the analysis we're used to. So the same model, the ANSEP model that uh, gave us, the same lineage that gave us ANSEP2, Hadley Center SST and CIs, but um, the idea is to assimilate only surface pressure observations, and what that allows us, not us, what, what allows COMPO to do is to go back to 1871 and have um, a much longer uh, reanalysis of observations. And uh, the way the assimilation is done is through something called the ensemble Kalman filter, which I'm not going to explain apart from saying that uh, these gives us 56 realizations instead of just one analysis of observations. We have 56 states that are com consistent um, with the, uh, the, the observation within the, the error that we have. Um, so why focus on tropical rainfall and rainfall in general and, and tropical rainfall in particular, which is something extremely hard to do for models? Um, the my motivation comes from 
the um, the fact that if we want to know where climate trends are coming from, if we want to attribute them to anthropogenic or natural variability, we really need to know uh, what the oceanic precipitation uh, did during the course of the 20th century. Um, for example, this is taken from a figure, um, a paper from Hurling et al. a decade ago now, but the idea here was to um, attribute trends in the NAO and therefore European climate, so on and so forth, to trends in precipitation in the Indian Ocean. And there's no way to confirm this chain of events if we don't have a sense of what the precipitation in the Indian Ocean did. So um, this was the original motivation for the project. Uh, let me just give you a, the briefest possible um, introduction to what the climatology looks like in the 20th century analysis. Um, I'm showing here the March, April, May seasonal mean. It's been uh, slightly filtered to um, get rid of some uh, features that come from the, um, the spectral noise. But other than that, this is the, um, the mean over 79 to 2008. And I picked March, April, May because it's a hard one to get right. Uh, you see in observations a very well-known feature of the northern ITCZ being much stronger than this um, remnant of an IPCC in the southern hemisphere. And uh, the, um, the bias of a double ITCZ is well known, strong in most models, and, and we see that the uh, 20th century analysis still has some of it um, not as strong as the previous generation. So um, what we're really interested, though, is the variability. And in particular, we want to know if we can trust the 20th century estimates for the pre-satellite era. And to, to prove that, we would have to show first that the 20th century does a good job over the satellite era. And we have, obviously, um, data not perfect, but we have good data for uh, both land and ocean. And, um, and to put the reanalysis in context, we're going to compare it to models that only know what the sea surface temperature was historically. So these are GOGA runs or AMIP runs where you have an ensemble with um, run with prescribed SSD and no assimilation whatsoever. And then on the other hand, we're going to compare the 20th century analysis to the ones that assimilate everything available. So the upper level observation, the satellites, and so on and so forth. And then um, at that point, we can go back and, and see, OK, how important is the quality and density of the simulated data? And uh, um, so you know, does the fit change over time? We have precipitation data over land going back to the 1900s. So we can, we can see how good the fit is um, earlier in, in the 20th century. OK. So. What's shown here is the seasonal cycle of the um, anomaly pattern correlation over 79 to 2008. And so what we did was to take the, um, from every January, let's say, 1979 to 2008, we take the pattern correlation between the anomaly in the uh, reanalysis and the observation. This in, in this case, this is GPCP. And, um, and then we do it for 30 times and see what the average is. And we plot it for January through December. So, um, and I'm separating now here the, mo the northern mid-latitudes and the tropics, land only, land and ocean. So what we see here is a couple of things. First of all, uh, the 20th century analysis is in black. The model that only knows SST here is in blue. This is um, 16 ensemble member um, down with the CCM3. And then red and, and green are the NCEP DOE and ERA interim reanalysis. So um, we see very good correlations and especially you know comparable correlations between the um, the 20th century reanalysis and the more comprehensive reanalysis um, in the northern mid latitude, and we see obviously a huge gap compared to the uh, the model that um, that doesn't do any uh, assimilation. Uh, we also see very clearly that winter is a lot easier than summer. 
and that the mid latitude in general are easier than the tropics and um, it doesn't really change much whether you include only land or if you include land and ocean. If you include the ocean, our interim keeps doing um, better in the summer. Uh, the dip in, uh, in the correlation is still present for the 20th century analysis. We can look at a different measure of how well their analysis does, and this is the temporal anomaly correlation over 79 to 2008. So here, for each grid point, we look at uh, the time correlation for December, January, and February. And um, this is now correlated against CMAP. And uh, the top is the 20th century analysis. And just to, to give a sense of um, the, what the competition does, the error interim uh, is in the bottom here, and then here we have two estimates of observations from two different products, CMAP and GPCP, um, just to have a sense of where we actually don't know what the observations um, tell us about rainfall. So we, so the best correlations are for DJF, North America, um, most. Uh, strikingly Europe. Um, we also see some good correlations over land, specifically, for example, northeast Brazil, where we know that rainfall is very tightly linked to sea surface temperature. And uh, we also see that we have some serious trouble in places like the Indian Ocean and, uh, um, and the Western Pacific. And um, I'm not as worried about the islands here because it turns out we, you know, even observations don't really agree on on rainfall over there. But definitely, over the Indian Ocean, there's a there's a gap in scale. Um, so let's look at some time series for some regions. Uh, this is the Mediterranean, and we're only looking at winter, so the seasonal anomalies, um, and it's plotted. In, um, in green is observations, in red is the analysis. And um, the correlations are 0.87 between the 20th century and, uh, and, and this is the University of East Anglia crew uh, data set, the CS 3.1. And we see not only that the observations, uh, that the correlations are very good, but they, are, they stay good throughout the century. So the, the previous 40 years are correlated in 0.9 and before 0.83. And uh, comparison with our interim and uh, ANSEP DOE, um, interim does better, but same ballpark. Um, of course, the, um, the CCM3 model does much, much worse with a correlation of 0.15. Um, a region where we know of a great influence of sea surface temperature in the mid latitude is southwest US. And so here, even just with knowledge of SSD, we get the correlation about 0.58. Uh, but still, of course, um, assimilating some data helps. So we have a very good correlation. And there's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit degraded at the beginning of the record. But again, same ballpark. We are going from 0.7 to 0.86. Um, the more comprehensive analysis do even a uh, higher correlation. Um, one thing that is worth pointing out is the fact that, um, as I said, we have in this case an ensemble. We can compare the ensemble in the 20th century analysis to the one where only sea surface temperature is known. And so here, um, now it's a shorter record. We have uh, just plotted from 79 onward to 2008. And so what I want to point out is the fact that the, the spread across the ensemble member is very small. Um, remarkably, it's, it's, um, it's wider exactly in those places where the reanalysis kind of fails to, to match observations, um, so here, for example. And each ensemble member is correlated above 0.8 with uh, observation. That's to be compared to what the, the Goga runs do, where uh, overall the um, ensemble member, uh, the ensemble mean is well correlated, but we have um, a widespread and uh, correlation ranging from 0.3 on. 
um, what's plotted here, sorry, I should have said it to begin with, uh, but the, the, the darker gray is the 25th to 75th percentile, and uh, the lighter gray is the 5th to 95th percentile. Um, a region that is dear to me is the Sahel, and so I want to see what the Renaissance did in this area. And so here we are hitting um, a, a place in the tropics where, where things are hard. And, uh, and so the overall correlation for the Sahel for the entire 20th century is 0.4. And, um, and it doesn't seem to be uh, an issue with the uh, how dense the observing system is uh, in, in general, though I'm not sure in this area how um, all that changes over time. Um, but uh, to give you uh, some perspective, to put this number 0.4 in perspective, um, if you simply impose the observed SST in a GOGA run, depending on the, the model you have, you get correlations that range from 0.21 to uh, 0.6. So, um, for example, there's a paper by Giannini et al. in 2003 that shows that you know, the NCIP1 model just forced with SSD gets you correlations in the Sahel of 0.6. So, um, it's a little bit um, of a disappointment. On the other hand, um, as I said, it's, um, um, this is a widespread problem. So, for example, the era interim for the same period and and for the same uh, region has a correlation of 0.15. So um, again, there are um, places that are, the, the tropical convection is just hard. Um, not everything is lost. Um, here's a map of the correlation um, between the monthly June, July, and August. This is the top panel. The monthly June, July, and August in uh, the reanalysis and observations. And um, so this is a, a different color scale from what we used before. Um, so there's, as I said, there's lower correlation in places like the Sahel that we would like. On the other hand, there's an indication that um, there's more skill at the edge of the convection zone. So poor correlations within the ITCZ but better correlation at the edges. And um, if we ask an even harder question and we want to see how well we do with daily rainfall, then um, that's shown in the second panel. And uh, so this is the correlation of daily values of uh, rainfall, but only for the um, northern summer season, June, July, and August. And, um, and again, we see um, weak correlation within the convection zone, but better values at the edge, especially in the Atlantic ITCZ. Um, so one last slide to give you a sense of how important the changes in the observing system are for, for these kind of questions. Um, this is, uh, again, the pattern correlation um, done for the tropics and for the northern mid-latitudes, DJF and JJA. And, uh, and so we're plotting how that evolves during time from the beginning of the 1900 to 2008. And um, so there's a clear sense that um, there's an improvement as the observing, um, as the observations that are simulated are, are becoming more dense, but it's not um, necessarily a dramatic improvement, and you can read it two ways, either you know the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. I, I tend to say, okay, um, you know we can go back and, and trust the uh, the beginning of the record reasonably well, given that we do uh, quite well at the end of the record. So in conclusions, um, the 20th century analysis captures the winter variability of rainfall in the latitudes with very good accuracy. It's comparable to air interim, which is um, a remarkable accomplishment. And uh, um, there are problems with summer rainfall and tropical rainfall. And I don't think that um, then, therefore, those are constrained enough to, um, to tell us much about long-term trends, which is unfortunate. 
Um, on the other hand, even though maybe the intensity of rainfall might be hard to get to, um, we can probably use this data set to track the position of convective centers, in particular the ITCZ. And um, getting our hands on more observation can probably improve the reanalysis, but um, for, for some more, I guess, bulk measures, I think that we can say that even a sparse record is sufficient to constrain seasonal variability, uh, at least in the winter mid-latitudes. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Michaela. Ron, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I'm going to switch control over your computer. Now I'm the presenter. Okay. Yes. And so just go to Quick Start tab and then uh, share my desktop. Can you see that yet? No, i got to do that. Sorry. No problem. Okay, do you see that? Yeah, it looks great. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, let me get started here. Uh, here at the Polar Science Center, we um, uh, run an, a coupled ice ocean model that needs uh, atmospheric forcing to, 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 to drive it. So we need the temperatures, the downwelling, short wave, and long wave radiation, and the winds in order to drive the coupled ice ocean model. The model is called the PO mass model, which some people may have heard of. Uh, it's been used to determine, for example, the total ice volume, the trends in the total ice volume in the, uh, in the Arctic. So uh, we're interested in which of the various reanalysis might be most appropriate to drive the model, and then also in the trends in the important forcing fields, the temperature, the fluxes, and the precipitation. So I'll talk just a little bit about the different models, and then uh, talk some about the temperature, the radiative fluxes, the precipitation, and the winds in, in that order. So the seven models we're considering are the NCEP R1, also known as the NCEP, uh, NCEP NCAR reanalysis, the NCEP R2, uh, which uh, begins their analysis in 1979, uh, also known as the NCEP DOE, uh, the CFS uh, reanalysis, and the 20th century uh, reanalysis version two. So those first four are all actually NOAA models, different NOAA models. The MARA model is the uh, NASA model. The ERA interim, of course, comes from the Europeans, and the JR20, JRA25 come from the Japanese. So of these, um, all of them have prescribed sea ice and SST lower boundary conditions, except for the CFS, which has a fully coupled global ocean and ice components. Um, I'll just mention also that the, SS, the sea ice in the 20th century reanalysis has a problem in the Arctic, uh, and there's um, much too little ice along the coasts of the, uh, well, anywhere there's ice. And so the Arctic, particularly some of the fields in the, in the Arctic for the 20th century are quite bad, and I'll, I'll mostly ignore that as we go through the presentation. Uh, so let's start with the, 20, the two meter air temperatures. So here we compare it with some observations from the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. Um, most of the reanalyses do not assimilate the two meter air temperature, although the ERA interim product does a post, a post processing optimal interpolation between the lowest levels of the um, of the model simulation and the observations. So in some sense, they cheat. And so, of course, their uh, biases are quite small. Here are the, the blue line going across here. Uh, and so uh, we, we won't give them extra credit for that. Uh, we can see the large bias in the 20th century, particularly in the winter uh, and, and spring. Uh, the two NCEP reanalyses, these two red and, and dark, dark red, uh, have a, a low bias, by and large, uh, in the summer. Um, the anomaly correlations, in which we take out the spatial variability, 
uh, is quite high for the area interim, of course. Also quite good for the MERA and the CFS. Uh, here we have some maps. Uh, on the upper left is the median of all seven reanalyses. So uh, this is the winter, December, January, February, uh, for 1980 to 2009. And of course, we can see the cold continents in the cold Arctic Ocean uh, and warm uh, oceans in the Atlantic and the Pacific. The rest of the maps are the anomaly of each of the reanalyses from the median. So um, in all these, I'll have a whole set of these maps, and it's always in the same order. The two ends up at the, uh, in, at the upper row with the 20th century on the right. And then the CFS, the MERA, the Air Interim, and the JRA along the bottom. So for the two meter temperature anomalies, uh, we see that the NSEP is generally lower than uh, the median. So the median is necess not necessarily the truth because there's no observations here. It's just the consensus of the models. So um, we have to keep that in mind when we, we make these interpretations. Um, so the outlier side from the 20th century is the NSEP uh, R1, NSEP R2 by and large removes that cold bias over the ocean. Uh, in the spring, the only uh, outlier, uh, of the outliers of note are the MERA, which has a warm bias compared to the, the median in uh, over the Arctic Ocean, as well as the JRA-25. So this could be um, some anomaly in the radio fluxes. We'll come back to that later. Or it could be a difference in the way sea ice is treated in the MERA product uh, and the JRA product. Maybe the ice is too thin or the heat conductivity through the ice is too large. Um, so these are the uh, two meter annual temperature trends. And um, the order of the maps are the same, although here we have the trends, the actual trends for each of the reanalyses, not the anomalies. Um, because it gets confusing with the change in sign of the, of the trends. So a uh, most note here is that the two NSEP reanalyses are, are much larger than any of the rest. Um, the, um, the consensus of the ensemble mean median shows uh, warming both in the East Siberian Sea and in the Barents Sea, uh, most likely associated with the large reductions in sea ice in those two regions. Um, and all the reanalysis, by and large, find a, a very strong and significant trend. The, the, the solid lines in the uh, in the, re the individual reanalysis maps are the 99% confidence intervals for the trends. So, um, so all of them show uh, a significant trend in the in the Barents and the in the East Siberian seas. Uh, interestingly, the Mara and the Era Interim show a negative trend in the areas north of the Greenland archipelago. Uh, here we see how the trends are distributed uh, over the depth of the atmosphere. So this is the trend north of 70 degrees north versus the season of the year, so January through December, uh, and going from the skin temperature up to 150 millibars. Uh, again, the, the uh, green lines here are the 99% confidence intervals. So by and large, all of the models show strong warming in the fall uh, at the very lowest levels of the atmosphere. Um, and the warming is not, not distributed through the depth of the atmosphere, except perhaps in the MERA product, product in the late summer. Here we see significant warming in this project, and to a lesser extent, the ERA interim. Now we'll turn to the surface downwelling radiative fluxes. So I have here some comparisons with the observations taken at the arm measurement sites at Barrow in Alaska and Neolisund in Svalbard. And there's a total of 30 years, uh, 30 station years uh, in, in, from those two, two uh, stations. And this is from the, uh, the arm series validation experiment, CAVE. Um, 
So first, looking at the long wave bias, the seasonal, the seasonal um, pattern in the long wave bias, first of all, the two NCEP ones, the dark red here, have a very low bias in the long wave and a very high bias in the short wave, almost 100 watts per square meter. So that's a huge bias in those two, um, those two products. And uh, that's undoubtedly related to there being too few clouds or optically thin clouds. Um, the JRA also has a large uh, negative bias in, in the long wave and a positive bias in the short wave. The uh, smallest bias is in the um, era interim, the dark blue, and the green line is the CFS, so that's also quite good um, in, in, uh, in the long wave and also in the short wave, not quite so good in the, in the early spring. When we turn to the uh, anomaly correlations, uh, the correlations drop off for the long wave in the summer, um, largely because I think there's very little signal. It's always cloudy. So there's not a lot of variability in the long wave. Uh, correlations are pretty good for the uh, JRA in the winter, the JRA, which is this magenta, and the, uh, the blues are the era interim and the mera, and they are also quite good. Uh, the shortwave correlations are much more confusing and not as good. Uh, again, the JRA is pretty good as well as the era interim. So now let's look at our maps. So this is the long wave flux in the winter. <coughs> it, uh, the median pattern largely follows the temperature, the surface temperature pattern, uh, low low downwelling fluxes over the winter, in the winter over the uh, continents and over the Arctic Ocean, higher fluxes over the oceans. Uh, in the NCEP R1, we see this very distinctive ringing pattern, which has been noted before um, in both the, uh, the uh, downwelling fluxes as well as in the precipitation. Uh, the NCEP R2 has largely uh, solved that problem. Um, I'd note that the CFS has a much higher downwelling long wave, meaning likely more clouds over the oceans than the other data sets. In contrast, the MERA has much lower uh, radio fluxes over the oceans. Um, this is the long wave flux in summer. Um, Again, we see that uh, uh, there is some ringing in the in the uh, downwelling long wave in downwelling long wave in the summer over the oceans over the Arctic Ocean. The the anomaly compared to the median in these two uh, NCEP uh, analyses are largely confined to the Arctic Ocean. So how they're dealing with clouds over the sea ice is is, is perhaps a problem. Uh, the CFS and the air interim have a larger long wave flux. Um, the short wave fluxes are, um, let me see, they're, of course, in the spring, they're much lower at the, near the pole than they are at the lower latitudes, and we see this very strong uh, positive bias in the interim, in the NCEP products. I'll go ahead and skip ahead here. Um, the uh, short wave fluxes in the summer also show this same. Uh, strong bias problems. I'll skip ahead of here a little faster. Um, I have here the trend maps. Uh, I'll skip through these pretty quickly, the long wave trends. Mostly I wanted to show that there is a very strong long wave trends where we see uh, positive trends where we see largest changes in the sea ice. And that's what we'd expect with the warming, um, in, particularly in the fall. In the winter, this long wave Flux, uh, this long wave trend has largely disappeared. And, and I find that kind of significant because one of the possible um, causes for the decreasing thickness of the sea ice is increasing uh, long wave fluxes in the trend, in the long wave um, fluxes over the sea ice. And we don't really see that except in the Barents, Barents Sea. So let me skip ahead over these two and come to precipitation. Um, where we compare the observation, 
compare the models with the uh, uh, observations from the Global Precipitation Climatology Center, the full reanalysis version 5 data set. And we see here that the uh, spatial distribution is not entirely homogeneous. There's a strong uh, bias in the precipitation uh, in the CFS, uh, as well as in the 20th century. Uh, and this is in the spring. The, the biases are quite similar. Um, I'm not quite sure why. And I, and I expect the problems to be larger with the uh, CFS in the fall, but here we see a large change in the spring. Uh, the best ones are the, um, the best biases with the Japanese uh, JRA25 product. The best anomaly correlation is with the uh, ERA interim. This is the annual precipitation, um, of course much lower in the northern latitudes. Uh, we see the ringing in the NCEP R1. Uh, the CFS is much moister, mo has more precipitation over the oceans uh, than the other products. Uh, and here we have the 10 meter wind speed. Sheba was a, a, a floating ice cap based on an on a icebreaker in the Beaufort Sea in 1997 and 1998. So there are very good uh, observations from um, surface, uh, surface towers out on the ice. The black line is from the observations. Um, we see in the summer most of them are pretty good. The NCEP R1 is low in the summer, does quite well in the winter. So uh, there's not a strong. Uh, I also like to show out that the point out that the other observations are all high in the winter. Uh, so here are our maps. Uh, I just have the winter, the winter here, um, and we see that uh, over the oceans where it's smoother, the wind speeds are much higher um, than over the land, and uh, to a lesser extent over the Arctic Ocean. The NCEP shows uh, in the winter. Lower than the median, but we saw in the in the compared observations it does quite well in the winter. So maybe actually the NCEP R1 is correct, and the other ones are, are too high. Um, and so finally, for conclusions, um, we find that the MERA does best in temperature um, in terms of bias, but the MERA CFSR and uh, JRA25 do quite well in the correlations. And the, strength, the trends are much, probably too strong in the NCEP R1 and R2 models. For the radio fluxes, the MERA, CFSR, and ERA interim all do quite well in both the bias and in the correlations. I think for the Arctic, um, my, in, in general, I think those three models all do pretty well, um, and there's not a strong winner between them. For precipitation, the JR25 has the smallest bias, but the anomaly correlation is best for the era interim. The MERA, JRA25, and CFSR also have pretty good uh, correlations. Uh, finally, for wind speed, NCEP R2 has a low bias uh, except in winter, and all the others have a high bias in winter. Otherwise, they do quite well, and uh, NCEP R2 is markedly higher than the others over the land. So uh, that's, uh, I just have some, some extra slides here. That uh, uh, wraps up the presentation. I'll take questions later on, I guess. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Ron. So we can do questions right now, actually, and I'd like to start in the room. Are there any questions from uh, attendees in the room? Uh, I guess I ha uh, Edmund, this is uh, Rick Rosen. Hello. Oh, sorry, Rick. Um, One second, I saw on mute. Okay, sorry about that, Edmund. You were muted before, but you're not now. Oh, okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, Go ahead, Ron. Uh, Edmund, I have a question about um, whether the 20th century reanalysis, uh, do you think it could be used for uh, uh, cyclone intensity and trends in intensity of, of uh, um, <coughs> mid-latitude storms? We actually are looking at that, and in terms of, in, uh, we, we actually look at sort of the strong, uh, I showed one figure which sort of compares the cyclone with the track count for the intense storms, and they agree quite well between the different reanalysis. 
And we've actually looked at uh, growth rate, uh, deepening rate, and again, uh, they are more or less consistent. So in terms of quality, I would say that the, it seems that cyclone intensity, uh, the quality of 20th century reanalysis is not, uh, it's, it's about the same as uh, those in EI40 and NZM NCAR reanalysis over the period uh, since 1958. So uh, we actually are trying to sort of access, uh, assess that. But the question is, the, the problem is that it's difficult to really assess how good intensity is uh, for cyclones. Uh, because um, they're, they're, it's difficult to assess from observations because there there aren't much comparison between. Uh, it's hard to 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 compare this with observations. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you. Are there any questions on the phone line? <coughs> Any other questions in the room? Yeah, um, this is Anarita. Hi, Mika, I have a question for you. I'm hi. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering whether you looked at uh, CFSR uh, and whether you have a sense of the results uh, that you found using SFUE analysis would be similar with CFSR. Oh, I haven't looked. I. Um, well, I'm sorry, I can't answer this question. We haven't looked uh, at CFSR. Any other questions in the room or on the phone? Okay, well, we'll call it quits for today. We're going to be back in two weeks with uh, the second webinar in the series. It's on the topic of CMIP-5 evaluation. We'll be focused on 20th century results. And uh, we're going to have three speakers, uh, Julianne Strove, Zaitao Pan, and China and Jang. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you to our three speakers um, for giving these excellent talks today. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. All right.